Um, so my name uh, is Ray, and I am the Education uh, and Collections Manager for the Historical Society, and I am joined today by... My name's Anna, and I'm one of the volunteers here at the Lombard Historical Society. Well, we are so glad that Anna's able to join us today. Very excited to be here. Yes, <laughs> so we've got a very nice uh, little spread for us today. So we are drinking um, Victorian London Fog Tea, um, which is what was in the goodie bags if you purchased one. And that is from the uh, Harvey and Sons um, English uh, collection. The so most excellent tea, of course. <laughs> yes, it is wonderful. So I'm very excited. Um, I was telling Anna, I only have one tea bag left of it and it is going to come live at my desk um, and we will likely be reordering it for future programs. And then we also have a mix of Madeline's and uh, in honor of St. Patrick's Day, soda bread scones. Ooh. So, and as well as raspberry preserves and some whipped cream as well as we do have some uh, Ferrero Rocher chocolates as well. So hopefully uh, you have something sweet or savory uh, as well as we go through, spend some time together. Of course, my, there we go. Um, as we have our topic of conversation today is fashion of the 1870s to the uh, about 1900. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> Anna here is very knowledgeable. Um, she is a seamstress. She has made uh, pieces that both of us are wearing today. So I'm very excited that she's able to join us today. I'm excited to be here and be able to put my fashion house to the test here. <laughs> yes. So before we get to that, um, we are just going to start with a little bit of what tea time is, why we're having afternoon tea. Um, I know something that's kind of fallen out of fashion. We typically don't stop and true, true. Have tea. I think that our closest equivalent could be like a two o'clock Starbucks run, yeah. um, that two o'clock caffeine kick. Um, but it really is just a way to do exactly what we're doing today, which is, you know, have time together that we're spending in conversation, meeting with friends and in just in enjoying each other's company. So um, it is actually very likely that there was tea in this very room that we're in. So we're currently in the back parlor this is true. <laughs> of the Victorian cottage. Um, and we have a photo of the family that was the longest living here. So the Hill family, um, they did come from England. And <laughs> yes. And so um, that is George and Annie Hill are sitting there right at the center of the photo surrounded by their children and grandchildren. And it was actually um, taken. I know you guys can't see it, but probably straight in front of where Anna and I are sitting in the backyard. We have a lovely gazebo out there. Um, and so they would have definitely enjoyed tea, maybe not quite as tea like this, but still have enjoyed it. A nice outdoor tea picnic sort of. <laughs> yeah, they had um quite a lot of green space in their backyard. So they would have definitely had picnic space. I know I would have absolutely yes. no time. <laughs> now we also uh see with tea that it's um you know we have high tea and low tea. So today actually do you know what kind of tea we're having right now? I believe this would be high tea in that case. Yes. Do you know why? <laughs> yes. So it's because the table is further off the ground. High tea, high table. <laughs> yeah, I actually it wasn't really until I started doing research for these that I realized, um, you know, it was high tea, like had to do with the table height. Um, because we think, you know, I always think of the Walnut Room in downtown Chicago right. or like the fancy tea rooms that we have here in the States. We kind of miss the translation a little bit from, um, you know, England where people did equate it to tea height or to table height we um had you know this kind of time to just like be really fancy in the united states that's true um and someone does say british tea was in late afternoon to hold people over till dinner uh yeah you are absolutely right um queen victoria who this time period is named for she decided that supper was at like 8 or 9 p.m but lunch was still at noon I don't know about you, but eight hours is a little bit long for me to go without food. <laughs> eight or nine is when I'd be going to sleep. Nowadays. <laughs> yes, especially this time of year with the no sun. Oh, God. Um, <laughs> but there was a duchess whose name is escaping me, but we do know her name. And she decided to have cake in the afternoon as a way, as you said, to like hold her over. Mm -hmm. um, Queen Victoria saw this and said, absolutely. 
I want cake in the afternoon. So a little bit different than the let them eat cake sentiment this of, is true. of Marie Antoinette, but <laughs> a, very similar um, to that. Now, we also do have, um, in addition to kind of high and low tea, there's also meat tea, um, which is just realistically more of um, a meal per se. So rather than being just kind of little nibbles like we have today, um, it really was a way to um, have a full meal, mm -hmm. which gets away from, I think, its original purpose, but um, just goes to show how customs, you know, evolve throughout the years. Mm -hmm. um, but with that, I think we'll move on to what we really are all here for and what we're all very excited for the is, part. is the Oh, fashion, I keep forgetting this doesn't want to work, is the fashion of the Victorian era. So um, I keep referring to the Victorian era, um, and technically it goes through the entire reign of Queen Victoria. It was a very long reign. It was too. a very long reign. So she technically reigned, or not technically, she did reign from 1837 to 1901. Mm -hmm. As I said at the beginning, we're only looking at a handful of decades because especially in the United States, I mean, during that period, we want to have the Civil War um, and fashion, especially women's fashion and even men's fashion just changes so drastically. Mm -hmm. In the States, we typically look at kind of like the Belle Epoque era yeah. realistically is what we're talking today. Um, but why fashion? So, I mean, fashion... I think we've got fashion weeks happening pretty close or have just happened in Paris and New York. I know one just happened, I think a week ago or two weeks ago, I think in Chicago, actually. I think. Yeah. So, I mean, when you look at, you know, modern fashion runways, they are a symbol of status. They're a symbol of wealth and they're really, they're art. This is so true. And this is the truth back then. So, I mean, we have, um, this is a piece from our collection on the screen um, this is a beautiful maroon and we have a close up of the sleeve detail that has these tiny little um, flowers that are embroidered. Um, and that's what those kind of dot pattern is over the entire thing. And so that's really, I mean, painstakingly artistic. And so mm -hmm. it really is a way to, um, you know, show off a level of skill because it was all handmade at that point, mm -hmm. all the trimmings and embroidery up until we get into like the industrial area. Industrial yeah. Era. So it's definitely, um, I don't know about you, but I think I would probably bleed more than I would actually um, make some of these pieces. Because while I do have sewing <laughs> experience, um, I also managed to use my fingertips as a pin cushion quite a bit. I think at this point, my fingers are just immune to that <laughs> with the amount of times I break myself while making my garments <laughs> but it, so it leads into you know these beautiful pieces of art but also I mean you said it like it's all handmade so it's mm -hmm. so expensive and it's not oh something that everyone can afford so even a piece like this which might have more machine made elements um because this one is from about like 1890s yeah um but it's still like the cost of any sort of detail work is astronomical so this would mm -hmm. not be something like when we look at a lot of the fashion we'll be talking about today yeah. this isn't necessarily what the average person oh yeah no. is is affording so you have to have wealth at that point to afford something that extravagant <laughs> exactly now we are going to talk a little bit about men's fashion um so also on the screen this is one of the pieces in our collection we've had this at Lombard since the 70s um and this is also from about the 1880s um and personally I find women's fashion more exciting than men's fashion I don't okay. know if it's because I can see myself in the dresses there's just more detail and like more yeah detail in the yeah <laughs> I also feel like men and we kind of see this too, like as far as the collection goes, is we have a lot more women's pieces than men's pieces because this classic lines and styles, as I say on the screen, they persist throughout the decades. So I feel like they got worn more to rags almost. Very true. And so a lot of them don't exist because they kept getting reused until they were unusable and therefore not necessarily something that we would look to preserve today. True. Um. But we re really the biggest changes are going to be kind of the coat style. Mm -hmm. So on the screen, I this is more of a frock style coat. Um, and that kind of refers to where the coat is hitting. So with a frock style coat, 
it's um, going to about the knees. And it, the one that we have on the screen today isn't as full, but there are some that we see um, that have just like a full skirt almost. Oh gosh. Like and a whole swing skirt attached to that. <laughs> right. And so it's really, um, yeah, those, they're very cool looking. Mm -hmm. um, but those, I think those kind of fell out of style, like in the 1880s, 1870s, we start seeing them um, kind of go in fashion of like the sack coat. True. The more looser, more mm -hmm. something more, I guess, economical is the right word for when going outside. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I mean, it, it also, the coat that we have here, this is kind of like, I'd say a little bit of like a almost frock sack coat in that mm -hmm. it's still kind of hitting a little bit longer than maybe like a traditional sack coat. Mm -hmm. Um, but it definitely isn't as full as like a frock, true okay. frock coat. This is true. Yeah. So we also, um, you know, we see with, uh, like formal wear too. I don't know about you, but like coat and tails, Oh gosh. <laughs> Does not go out of style. No, it still exists even in this age. Right. They're very timeless. <laughs> so we have um, the image that's on the left on the screen. That is um, a coat with tails. And so you can see that it's cut very short um, in the front and then it would have the tails that go down the back. And it's just, um, you know, I have a friend who's getting married this year and so she and, you know, talking about suit styles and just kind of looking at them of like, that was around in the 1800s. That was around in the 1800s. Bow ties and suspenders, very much so back in fashion. Oh, absolutely, yeah. <laughs> so I feel like, especially with men's clothing, we can see a lot of pieces from the Victorian era still very popular mm -hmm. um, today. And so, even I mean, the idea of the three piece suit it comes, you know, with the waistcoat from the Victorian era. That's true. Um, and then this is really uh, with the three-piece suit. Um, it's the waistcoat where you see the most personality. So it's true. Um, you know, the, I don't know if you've like brocades and those mm, kind brocades, of. Brocades, Yeah. And yeah. so those very like patterned um, outfits, um, you know, a lot of times we think, and I'm guilty of this too, where it's just, they're all dark and the images that I have on the screen do not help that because those are what are in my collection. Um, but they did have some fun colors in there. Oh gosh, absolutely. And, um, you know, plaid was a popular pattern. I'm trying to think what else would have been. Stripes also, and mm -hmm. like tartan kind of styles as well. Yeah. So there definitely were, um, you know, fun things in men's clothing. Um, unfortunately, like I said, those aren't the ones that stay that we have uh, in our collection today. But that would be uh, if you weren't doing a completely matching set, that's where they would bring in some of like the personality would be yeah. that kind of waist suit coat. Yeah. Um, and we do see also accessories kind of have the biggest change. Um, that's true. You know, I don't know if any of you guys have ever like had a really starched collar. Oh, gosh, I've had to make one of those before. <laughs> It's it's not fun. <laughs> they are, we have a couple in our collection and like you pick up one end of them and they just like go straight out. Completely straight. It's really weird. It's, yeah. And you know, this idea of that the collar is separate from the shirt. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, today we see, you know, any sort of button up pretty much has the collar already attached. Yeah. And um, they're like, it sits lower on the neck as well. Mm -hmm. Not so high like it used to, like, like right in the middle. Yeah. And um, they don't poke you as much. This is true. <laughs> a lot more comfortable, that's for sure. <laughs> yes. And so that's what probably for men's fashion where we see the biggest change is the collar style. You can see on the um, photo that has um, the waistcoat that he technically doesn't have a collar really, or it's a very short collar that's attached. Um, and so that's where we see a lot of big style change. The other one is like ties. Mm -hmm. So bow ties were still popular back then. Um, and they were still used. Um, we also see what we have. I always mispronounce it's cravats, 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 cravats. Yeah. Um, is the style that we have in the center. So a little bit more like volume around the throat true um and like ascots and jabots mm -hmm. also were yeah. popular then too and i'd say this is another area where they like bring in um 
some of the personality and flair of the person exactly. wearing it. I don't know. I look at all these men's clothes and I sometimes think of how dour. All of right. these clothes, like, I mean, and it's it's our my modern day bias of like you're dressing like you're going to your wedding or your funeral or like I really hope it's a funeral because it's very uptight. Oh gosh, yes. So much dark clothing. Correct. So uptight. Um and then also, I mean, well, actually the the newsboys style hat that I have on the screen, I feel like I've seen, you know, in the early 2000s was popular. I think I had a hat or two like that. Uh, I don't know how popular they are right now, but I. They're fairly popular. But they're Not coming in and out of style. popular, but like I've seen a lot more of them than. I have in the past (laughs) yes so um and then obviously uh not pictured here but we have top hats um which a lot of them are made from felted beaver fur Mm -hmm. um we've got a couple of those in our collection that were on display this past summer um and yeah top hats really those (laughs) aren't aren't too much in style anymore oh sadly (laughs) (laughs) I, i I do love to say I did know someone in college who would walk around sometimes wearing a top hat just those characters you see at university and you're like good for you for knowing what you want in, to dress like when I was doing theater stuff there was one actor who always wore a top hat always <laughs> and he was my favorite person in the world because of it <laughs> that is very funny um but like I said kind of as we move through the decades this is where we see the biggest changes as you know your ties um your uh you, like you said, between the bow tie, the ascot, like you said, yeah. hats, um, bowler hats are also popular for men during this time. So a little less formal. Um, and you also have straw boaters. So mm-hmm. uh, it was definitely important, though, that you did have um, something covering your head. It was part of the society standards, society norms back then. <laughs> yes. And you wanted to hold to society standards. Absolutely. Um, but moving from men's fashion into women's fashion but speaking of society standards (laughs) yes oh my (laughs) there were oh god it's you know a new wardrobe for every season so this image is from uh the goatees of eight as i say 1975 18 uh (laughs) 75 i believe uh and so this is just showing um some examples of what was in fashion for this year and it's really with women where we see the fashion kind of cycle coming in um because you mentioned earlier the industrial revolution yeah so we have things like the shirt waist um factories that's true the textile factories as mm-hmm. well yeah so even just having the cloth ready made for you no longer have to weave it yourself or you know have someone else weave it for you uh, and so this really led to a boom of people buying clothes oh gosh yeah and, you know, just not necessarily waiting for them to be, you know, worn out to replace them. Sometimes we see people, um, especially the like super wealthy, we're going to, you know, from Chicago, New York to Paris mm-hmm. to buy brand new wardrobes for every season with all of the layers. So many layers, so many trimmings. <laughs> Can you... I'm going to give you a little quiz. Can you, uh, how many, I want to see how many layers of of traditional Victorian women's outfit you can name. Okay. Challenge accepted. Yes. Let's see. Let's see. We have, for starts, we have the chemise, Mm -hmm. which is just your basic undergarment. On top of that, you would put the corset and that would be, that would actually have very different styles as well. Mm The very through the time periods. Over that, you would put a corset cover. And that kind of helped hide the fabric of the corset. Mm -hmm. So if you're wearing something white, you wouldn't see the lovely black or blue (laughs) corset you're wearing underneath. That's a little weird for that time period. After that, you would put petticoat. Mm -hmm. Well, it depends. If it's the 1870s, the natural form era, there were no cage bustles then. So that's when you just put the petticoat with the very very voluminous back. (laughs) Um, Then later in the 1880s, that's when you get the cage bustle that goes Mm -hmm. on. Then the petticoat goes under that. Then you would put another petticoat under that. Anything to kind of soften out the cages and the ribs of the bustle. Then after that, you would put on the underskirt, which that would be one of the more elaborately trimmed pieces. Mm -hmm. Um, That's where all the ruffles and the bows and the trims and the beads come in. Then you put an overskirt on top of that (laughs) because you have to make it look extravagant because that's what the Victorians are all about yes and then after that you would put on the bodice finally 
and the rules are boots before corset so make sure you have your boots on before you put the bodice and everything else on <laughs> I would say yeah you you got them all I say the only one that uh sometimes they do at they do wear bloomers depending on oh, the season true, so yeah. they might have some bloomers on as well but I think you just labeled like eight <laughs> different layers and you know I today I have on a cage vessel a petticoat underskirt and an overskirt and the, and even <laughs> that is like heavy and I found myself like knocking things over and then there's me who has the chemise plus the corset plus the mm -hmm. corset cover plus the cage bustle plus the petticoat plus the overskirt and yeah. the underskirt <laughs> Anna's being an overachiever I decided I didn't want to wear my corset today <laughs> <laughs> but it's it is quite a bit and so we really see you know that um they go so detailed with what they are choosing to wear and as you know we know like you must all like so they say with you know one of the texts like that I love is um uh they that always the dress must conform to the feelings considered correct in the moment um and I did see we will stand up in our outfits at the end um to to show them off so no you did not miss us standing up uh, in our outfits um but it's I can you imagine like getting up first thing and putting all of that on like to like oh, do your God. chores that's just <laughs> so we actually we're gonna talk about our first style of outfit which is daybreak morning robes and wrappers mm -hmm. the bathrobes of the 19th century <laughs> exactly so the piece that you see on the screen this is part of our collection um unfortunately this piece will probably never be displayed um it is kind of a oh what did I say it's like a felt or a flannel excuse me um with this beautiful um black kind of lace overlay you can see from the back panel or the, the back side view of the image that it goes all the way down trims the lay trims the bottom unfortunately it has like a taffeta silk lining um oh, no. <laughs> and one of the challenges with preserving textiles specifically natural fiber textiles is you know like anything they do decompose so unfortunately the inner liner is doing what we call shattering mm -hmm. which means that just the silk is no longer able to hold on to itself even um and so it will stay in its box it will be preserved I got these beautiful photos of it um so I'll be able in multiple different angles and close-ups um but it's doing that but this is a wonderful example of a wrapper it's very loose fitting um and this would be uh quote according to the style and the guide to economy style and propriety from 1870 um it was never worn to receive visitors and was reserved for private use in one's own um room and so you know this is suitable only for the invalid or breakfast so i mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> you are essentially i'm if wearing this very long sleeve full length you know fairly high necked robe you are essentially naked in the Victorian era if you wear this in public I'm so sorry to yeah. <laughs> share with yeah. you but um yeah they're they're very nice pieces so as you know we talked about all of the layers it wasn't expected that you get into them right away so <laughs> you do not have to get up at 6 a.m and put on all 20 layers that you're wearing that would be just awful <laughs> yes um and it's really you know they say that this would fit, you know, you know, the only time that that would be acceptable is if some like an emergency. So they do make some acquisition, you know, true. Uh, I was going to say acquisitions. That's not the right word. Um, exception. Exception. <laughs> thank you. I clearly have not had enough tea or caffeine today. Um, <laughs> not completely. I'm right there with you. <laughs> um, but they would probably have a petticoat still on underneath this. Um, and they would be, um, you know, have some layers. So they wouldn't be just wearing this, but this would be a nice way to kind of get the day started um, and, you know, wear with propriety. Now, um, we also sometimes can't necessarily tell everything what's a wrapper because I look at this um, and say, oh, this would be appropriate to wear out because a lot of times they do follow like the body shape trend. So um, in the 
Victor like the 1870s there's an emphasis or in the 1880s excuse me an emphasis on like the bustle and so a lot of times morning rappers will have a bustle yeah I'm just uh, it. <laughs> and so it's sometimes hard to determine what's what and these would also probably be pieces that um you would also probably wear until they're unwearable I don't know about you but there's something comforting about like it's my bathrobe that I'm putting on in the morning that's true and so they don't necessarily want to um replace them thing that it's not even meant to be seen by the public if everyone was seeing you and you had to show off for everyone maybe but probably not in this case mm-hmm. now the next one we will be talking about is the sporty Victorians. Ooh, fun time. So, so believe it or not, Victorians did exercise and women did exercise even in the kind of clothing that we're wearing today. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so they would, um, we had a Lombard, Lombard Ladies Athletic Association um, and we have a great photo of them from the 1890s and they are um, wearing these super like big kind of mutton chop sleeves and they're in dresses, something very similar. Um, I found the photo after I'd put this presentation together, otherwise I would have used it. Um, But actually it is uh, going to be on our Facebook, if not sometime this month. I can't remember if it's come out yet or if it will come out yet, Um, but similar to the center image. And so women would do croquet, tennis, archery, bowling um, in full skirts, which is a lot. It is. It really is. So it is a lot of, t- I feel like that that's less dangerous. Um, but we also see, you know, there's the funny stereotype for the Victorians that uh, how dare you see a woman's ankles and it's so <laughs> scandalous. Mm-hmm. Um, these, you can see like even these kinds of outfits. Well, yes, she is wearing boots. And so you probably wouldn't actually see her ankles. The skirts and petticoats are actually coming a couple inches off the ground. Mm-hmm. So you're not tripping over them necessarily as you're walking and getting them dirty as you're also playing. Mm-hmm. Exactly. So they, Victorians were fairly practical. Mm-hmm. Um, now, you would see sometimes bloomers being worn for uh, riding bikes. So one of the things that we see in the Victorian era is we see a little bit more, I won't say relaxing of women's roles. Like it's still very much of the home sphere, but women are starting to be allowed to do things like ride bikes, for example. Yeah. Um, we actually, uh, and it was a, this was a question of, should women be allowed to wear you know, bloomers, you know, what pants are, you know, men's clothing at this point. Um, And so uh, Ellen Martin, who is one of my favorite ladies from Lombard, if you Mm -hmm. haven't learned about her, she, um, you know, especially during Women's History Month, she was a lawyer before women were allowed to argue in court. So Mm -hmm. she had to pretty much prep her uh, clients and say, congratulations, have fun. Uh, And knock it out um but she was also the very first woman to vote in the state of illinois um here in lombard and she wrote to uh the inner ocean uh newspaper and gave an article uh because they were asking you know should women be allowed to wear bloomers by riding bikes um and she said quote too much effort is wasted dealing with the skirts um i like the way she's thinking (laughs) exactly that you know and if you think like, you know, today bikes are, you know, safe. Yeah. You do have to obviously balance, but we've got chain covers and. Yeah. There's a bunch of safety things for bikes these days. Yeah. These were not necessarily the case in the past. I wheel bikes. <laughs> Girls are terrifying. <laughs> yes. Penny farthings are very scary, <laughs> but it's, it's the same thing. So if you can imagine like you know, one of my worst bike rides, I was wearing a skirt and I will never do that again. So I can't, and it was a very like, you know, the kid like ended at like my knees. So not, you know, a floor length skirt at all. And so I could not imagine having mountains of fabric around my legs, trying to ride a bike. Um, so it's very interesting to see where they're willing to make concessions in fashion for, um, for sports. Yeah. So, but this would be 
another way that we're seeing like individual kind of fashions. We also have the ever popular bathing costume. It's not a, it's not a swimsuit. No. It is a bathing costume. Whole bathing outfit right there. <laughs> uh, and so these would be, uh, as we move in like the early 19th century, we actually do see these as like full gowns. Oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so if you can imagine being fully dressed and then walking into the ocean. Shoes and all. So. <laughs> oh yes. I know that it was definitely, um, I think that I, I read somewhere or this was in my French class, a theme was a woman who, it's a, it was a very French book. So the protagonist, the woman was very sad, but I think she did end up drowning by walking fully clothed into the sea. Oh, jeez. Yeah, but it was, that's, but the bathing costumes of the period were not really any much lighter. So there was a very serious risk of accidental drowning from some of these early bathing costumes because they would get so heavy that if you were too far out, like they would just pull you down. And if tides came in, you mm-hmm. were in big trouble. Oh, exactly. And it's not like they were making these from like nice, light, like airy, like chiffons. No, it's wool. Wool. The worst thing to put in water. <laughs> so they're just like, I don't know if any of you have ever worn a wool sweater and like gone and played like out in the snow, which it's great for keeping you warm pain to dry later you know, it's so painful to dry later and like it's so heavy when it gets wet mm-hmm. um and so we do see them becoming a little bit shorter um as time goes on so like this particular image on the screen this is going to be from like the 1890s um and so we see that there is like a little bit of like a pantaloon um and you can see some ankle as well so we do see some calves so very scandalous scandalous um but there is like a little bit of like almost a peplum skirt over the hips yeah. um they have like you know short sleeves yeah as well but this full outfit would have been made of wool um and modesty was very important to the victorians absolutely um so they actually had their like bathing machines is what they would call them Oh my, (laughs) these are great. (laughs) And so they were essentially dressing rooms on wheels. And so you would change in this, you know, tent and then the tent would wheel itself into the ocean. And then you would be able to open up and then go swimming from there. Yep. (laughs) Talk about modesty. (laughs) And it's, it is a little, like we look at it today and it's just, it's so ridiculous from our point of view. Um, (laughs) You know, especially coming from, you know, we have bikinis and even like one piece, like what we consider very modest swimsuits today, a Victorian Mm -hmm. would look at and be horrified. They were absolutely (laughs) horrified. (laughs) Exactly. And so it's really, um, it's kind of funny, but we do see like um, that kind of iconic sailor suit design um, that were very popular in like Navy uniforms during this time gets emulated into bathing costumes so that a lot of blues and whites and stripes and little sailor hats and sailor outfits they love keeping with a theme (laughs) correct now probably my favorite oh that was oh that was not where I wanted to go a little far a little far (laughs) I apologize for that next uh is the formal the Mm. formal gowns the one that you're meant to be seen in (laughs) Correct. So this is um the it, so this is where we see a lot of the changes over year mm-hmm. because think about it we um you know there's seasons every year like I'm gonna pull even though Bridgerton is a little bit earlier than its Regency mm-hmm. rather than Victorian um you know they have the balls and the seasons and you go and you go to court for several months and so you are wanting to be seen but heaven forbid you wear the same thing twice. That would be just a bad thing. <laughs> you would be the laughing stock of, you know, the town. Mm-hmm. And so we do see that this is where, like I said, the most changes come in. So on the screen, we have the two images. The uh, this drawings is another goatees, which is um, kind of like a fashion magazine and also has like um, recipes and information about the time. So kind of like a, a woman's magazine yeah like a woman's book I think it was called that yeah one, or one names for it and so these are from like the 1970s 
or 1970s, 1870s. Sorry, we're also close well, enough. Well, it's enough. <laughs> Uh, just a hundred years off. <laughs> totally. uh, and so you can see that these are really structured in the back and have a very kind of narrow skirt design. Um, and there's an emphasis on trains and ruffles and lots of like tiers of skirts that you're looking at. Um, the more extra extravagant they were, the higher you had a place in society, essentially. Mm -hmm. Um there's, you know, they would put flowers on, mm -hmm. on these dresses. And then comparing to the photo that is um, from the uh, 1890s. And so only, you know, about, you know, 20 or so years apart, maybe even a little bit less. And the skirt style has completely changed. There's still an emphasis on, you know, the butt, kind of the, making the butt look a little bit bigger and some ruffles back yeah. there. Um, but it's a lot wider. Um, we're going back more to the bell shape of like the antebellum. Um, not quite as like full hoop as back fully then. Round. Um, but it's interesting to see how much the the fashion changes um in those two, you know, decades that's or so. True. And that's something that we see continuing even with fashion today. Um and then probably like my favorite kind of oxymoron of the Victorian era is, and I've mentioned this before, you know, it's modesty. Very true. We always think, you know, keep your wrists covered, keep your ankles covered, the high collars. And then you look at some of the Victorian pieces and the neckline is like halfway down their chest. Mm -hmm. That was the only time they really allowed skin to be showed with emphasis on the clavicle area. Because yeah. apparently that was the most attractive area. <laughs> Don't know how, but I guess it was. <laughs> it, so it, it's just, it's very, it's very interesting for it, one of the things I find interesting, that kind of juxtaposition of yeah. modesty. Yet you look at something and even by today's standards being very kind of low cut and all, almost immodest. Yeah. But um, yeah, it's, it's interesting. We see, um, you know, with the tailoring and just the things that go in and out of style. So a lot of the goatees uh, images have like the cage bustle. Um, and so really kind of the emphasis on how big you can make your backside or not even necessarily big is how far out. Yeah. Um, <laughs> very, very horse like. Essentially, um, yeah. And we have uh, behind Anna and we'll make ourselves full screen um at the end so you guys can get a better look is we do have um this piece is from like the 1870s and she does have a bustle on her as well to give that kind of s shape mm -hmm. um we see as we get into more edwardian so about 1900 um they still are kind of emphasizing that shape but instead of like building the bustle out they actually create a new shape of corset Mm -hmm. the that, pigeon chest sort of yes thing. that like forces your chest forward and they put a lot more volume on the the front of the shirt like you said like the mm -hmm. what was it the pigeon chest yes the pigeon chest yeah. and so it's a lot of volume up here and that's when we start to get some of like the really big kind of mutton sleeves um coming back into style which mm -hmm. is very uh if you were around in the 80s um very similar to oh, okay. 80s fashions the 80s shoulder pads absolutely <laughs> um I do want to just mention that the image um does come from the Met collection um and it is actually a Brooklyn designer um Herbert Louis who um was a dressmaker in Brooklyn New York so it's a very very cool piece the the Met has their entire costume collection so um online and so if you're ever looking to just like find fashions, they're a great place to- Beautiful uh, pieces on there, beautiful. Yes. But today would not be complete without talking about the tea gown of or course. tea dresses. So <laughs> we're sitting down having tea. Um, and so these really first appear in 1877. Um, and we have kind of this date because- um, they appear in a magazine and we see it actually become popular. Like they're based off of Japanese kimonos is where the idea mm -hmm. comes from. Um, at this point, we are seeing a huge influx of trade from the East to the West. Um, 
and really kind of wanting to pull um, some of those styles. And they were inspired by a little bit of the looser fit of the kimono. Uh, and these are definitely a lot less structured. Um, That's true. So this particular piece um, is from our collection here as well. This is a black taffeta and you can see um, it has the bustle in the back. Um, and it also has this kind of tan pattern um, as well as these uh, mother of pearl uh, inlaid buttons that go all the way down the front. So this is kind of how we know that this was something meant to be seen versus like the wrapper is that it has a little bit more of these higher end details. That's true. Um, I won't lie. Sometimes I struggle with, is this a wrapper? Is this is a this tea, tea gown? Tea yeah. gown? Um, who is doing what? Uh, and so this is also a princess style cut. Yeah. So it's got the kind of that a little bit looser. Um, and this was the only kind of gown that was the more like casual mm -hmm. like wrapper fit that uh, you were allowed to see friends and close visitors at your home in. Yes. Because um, it's crazy how many times a day women especially would change their outfits in the Victorian era. Mm -hmm. So you have your wrapper that you would put on. Um, and then you could also then change into a house gown, which would be like for chores, chores which we didn't have any um, examples of yeah. today. And then you would have your tea gown. Yup, and that's what you would receive a guest in mm -hmm. to have tea with. <laughs> and then you have your dinner gown. So it's just... Uh, and then you get to go to bed yep. and put on your pajamas or your uh, undershirt. That's probably what you would sleep in. Yeah. And so it's just, it's very telling how often that they would like change. A lot of times it would be just their outer layer or they would be adding under layers throughout the day. Um, but it, it's quite a bit. Imagine having to do that nowadays, having to change four times a day, five times. Yeah. If that was um, a stipulation of going to work. Oh gosh, I, would, I don't, I would not be able to manage. Yeah. I, I, you know, I think I'm crazy some days when I have, you know, workout clothes that I change into and like, that feels right. like a lot of laundry to it me. Oh, this, gosh. Yeah. This doesn't even touch on like laundering oh, the clothes. That's its whole own set of uh, challenges. Um, but then we also have, this is kind of a mix between um, a tea gown or a morning wrapper. This one is probably a morning wrapper it might also be a tea gown because it has a little bit more of some of the fancy paneling on the front um but this particular piece um was uh from the 1870s um and it is part of the lhs collection um and this one um part of the reason i chose it today is this actually traveled with the woman who owned it and so this was when we talk about um you know the Eastern Japanese Chinese influences on tea dresses. She actually wore this dress uh, in Hong Kong. Really? Yes. That's so, so cool. Like, it's uh, traveled the world and gets to be on display here today. And like I said, we will make ourselves full screen and I'll bring these a little bit closer to the camera. So that way you'll be able to see both what Anna and I are wearing as well as the collection pieces. Mm -hmm. um, and so we also do see though um, with tea gowns, it was really meant for tea with other women. This is true. So once men start getting invited to afternoon tea, suddenly this very full length mother of pearl dress is not enough. And so they start becoming more and more elaborate because women didn't want to necessarily lose out on being able to wear something comfortable, mm -hmm. but they also didn't want to seem like, you know, quote, a floozy. Very sloppy. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. And so it was really, um, you know, important that as the tea becomes more and more popular, the dress kind of reflects that. Okay. Um, yes. And so it's uh, would also sometimes though be worn, like if you weren't having company and it was just immediate family that you were having dinner with, yeah. sometimes you would also still wear it for dinner. So yeah. you only put on a dinner dress if you're expecting company or if you're, uh, you're going out. Mm -hmm. um, yes. Um, I will say, you know, we talk about when in doubt, um, you know, we have all these very specific dresses and very um, 
you know, specific occasions for these. There's, you know, a whole subclass we didn't talk about, which was mourning clothing. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, that is a thesis unto itself, but there's, um, you know, whole rules about what you can wear if you are mourning uh, the passing of a uh, loved one, um, which I do recommend you come visiting us in October if you want to learn more about that. Mm -hmm. um, but they say, you know, through some of these etiquette guides, um, you know, Emily Post wrote in um, 1920. So a little bit later than this, but she was saying the one rule that is fairly safe to follow is that when in doubt, wear the plainer dress. It is always far better to be underdressed than overdressed. If you don't know whether to put on a ball dress or dinner dress, wear the dinner dress. Mm -hmm. Which I think it's kind of flipped a little bit in recent years. Is I've always yeah. heard it's better to be overdressed than underdressed. At least that's how I live. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes and so it's just very interesting to see how like we've kind of switched through the decades and I don't know if that's because our underdress tends to be like sweatpants yoga pants athleisure wear which can yeah. be very out of place um versus mm -hmm. like if you wear a dinner dress instead of a ball dress it's not as out of place True. um that's just one of the things that I found you know very interesting as we've talked about fashion yeah. through the years so um that comes to, I would like I said I will bring this stuff forward um but at this point does anyone have kind of any questions about Victorian fashion feel free to put them in the chat um and I will say now just you know a very nice thank you for listening to us as we get to talk about one of our favorite topics um you know, if you want to learn more about the Lombard Historical Society, um, visit LombardHistory.org. We've got some really great events coming up. We have on the 8th, um, we are with the Illinois Humanity Council. We have um, John Cooper as a jazz musician who will be playing. Um, we have on April 15th, a paint and sip. So if you're local to the area, um, you'll be making a custom original design of a lilac print, um, which brings us, we do have... Uh, on, or excuse me, on the next one will be March 22nd. We have Beneath Tudor Bed Sheets, which is a virtual program. So learning all about women uh, in Tudor England and talking a little bit about, you know, what was it actually like to be a Tudor woman then? Um, and then in August, if you are local, we are actually having an in-person garden party with tea um, and yes. other sweets here. Um, and then I also highly recommend you to follow Anna on Facebook. Um, she has her own design company, Autumn and Ivy, um, where she is available for commissions. So if you're thinking that you want to buff up your own Victorian closet, uh, I highly recommend uh, what she is wearing. So <laughs> with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. That's not what I wanted to hit. I wanted to hit stop sharing. Uh, and like I said, I will bring some of the pieces closer and bring them in front of the table. So I say that one might need to come around here. So I will move this one fully Ooh, my. in. This is what happens with the things you can't see behind the screen. <laughs> uh -oh. I'm just pulling things, but yeah, as you can see, this piece um, has some really nice kind of flower detailing on it. It is all wool. Um, it's probably silk printed, or what we could consider silk printing. It's got um, some very nice detailing up here, and then the iconic kind of bustle pattern as well. And I'm going to set this down because uh, our muscles are going to trip over it. <laughs> and then I will have bring this one forward. Now this particular 
This particular blue piece is actually one of my favorites in the collection. I know we are moving away from our microphones, so it might be hard to hear us. Um, is actually a uh, honeymoon piece. And so my favorite piece of the detailing is here on the side. And so this is all um, hand done beading up here. And she also has the very iconic, um, a little bit smaller bustle shape as well. And then I will move this to the side so that way Anna can show you what she is wearing. I will come. That happens. <laughs> so she, yes, yeah, she has the full bustle on it, the cage, crinoline. Uh, so we so we have the matching fabric, which is kind of popular back in the 19th century with having tops and bottoms matching into one single piece. I love it. And then today I also am wearing one of Anna's pieces, so it's kind of hard to see, but I have ruffles all the way down the back here. So uh, with that, I said we can go back to our seat. Um, but does anyone have any questions? Um, we're so we're always so happy when people get to join us for afternoon tea. So this is probably one of my favorite programs that we get to do um, with all of us. And so, um, like I said, if you have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat. Um, and thank you all so much for joining us. Thank you so much uh, for joining. Oh, what does the bustle look like? I say I can. Let's see, can I? I say I think I, I can get, get a little scandalous over here. I can get to I think mine maybe a little bit easier than something like. Oh, I don't know if you can really see it. It's a little bit harder to see. Yeah. Um, but what it is, is um, I'm trying to think of a good analogy. It's like a fabric cage, sort of. Yeah. So, so like a half cage. Yeah. So it's very, it's made with a similar boning to when we think of a hoop skirt, but it's, it's just kind of formed into like um, a more rounder and longer yeah. shape to kind of make the back protrude more. Yeah. So it's, yes. Um, but yeah, these are cage bustles and there's lots of different um, styles of them really kind of depending on what shape you want your skirt. So there are some cage bustles that actually go all the way down to the ground almost. That's there are, true. there are some like both Anna and I have um, ones that kind of just stop like mid thigh. Yeah. So it really just depends on the, the skirt. Um, and someone is asking, uh, you have your pocket watch yeah. on your chain. Um, and if women did wear those as well, and women did have pocket watches, oh, I'm forgetting the name because women also, if you had pockets, they were like also tied around your waist. So you, yeah. you know, there's the funny phrase, like you could lose your pocket um, and people actually could versus today in pants, like losing your pocket is someone cutting it out. Yeah. And so they had, um, if they didn't have pockets, they had like chains of things that chaplains they're called yes, yes thank you um and a lot of times they would have a pocket watch on one of those so mm -hmm. they're smaller and more delicate than like a men's pocket watch but they would absolutely um be used um and where women would use them uh did they change the shape of chairs to accommodate the bustle of the dress no didn't not really um so like today Anna and I are both like perched on the side um here so a lot of times you're sitting on the side of your hip um and it's luckily um part of the reason they made them wear corsets or corsets were popular is because it helps you actually sit up which is something mm -hmm. like with the bustle that you need to do with how you're sitting so you know there's this misconception that corsets are really uncomfortable um they're really not they do shrink the waist a little bit but they're more meant to feel like a hug sort of mm -hmm. like a big hug 
versus like constricting, trying to fit into the smallest sweater possible. Exactly. So they're real and they help support because I mean, these dresses are heavy. So instead of like having all that weight on you, now all the weight is on the corset. Mm -hmm. um, the only thing that the furniture that they kind of kind of change the shape of and this isn't for bustles this is more for like true hoops is if you see certain set tees like we have one that's off camera right here that has um like two high backs on either end and then the center is low and that would be so you could pick up your entire hoop to put it over the back um but that wouldn't work with a bustle that works with more of like when we think antebellum like full big like cupcake princess yeah kind of ball gowns I um, did remember seeing something. They actually had schematics for a bustle that had a built-in chair into it. <laughs> it literally, they it had a little like seat kind of inside the bustle and little legs that kind of go up when you stand up. But then when you try to sit down, they swing down. And they actually, I don't know if they actually made it, but there are schematics that exist for something like that. Interesting. <laughs> I don't know... I feel like that that is great. Like you said, great in theory or great to have schematics of. I don't know if they would actually be very functional. Would be, would work very well. The thought was nice though. The thought is very nice. I say, well, if there are no other questions coming in, I want to once again, just say thank you to all of you guys for joining us. Mm -hmm. Um, it's been a wonderful afternoon. I'm, I've been very, very happy. So <laughs> with that, I, we will bid you all adieu to enjoy the rest of your Saturday uh, and have a wonderful rest of your day. Enjoy the weekend. Thank you all so much. <laughs> Take care. Bye. Bye. <laughs>